So, so far in this class, we looked at how natural selection can alter allele frequencies and therefore phenotypes in a population. For example, we looked at how the beaks of the medium ground finch got deeper during a drought on Daphne Major. These changes within a species are what have been referred to as microevolution. But how do new kinds of organisms or new species evolve? This much larger process is known as macroevolution and is something we'll examine in more detail in this lecture. And specifically, we'll talk about ligers. And if you haven't um, seen Napoleon Dynamite, you should definitely check it out. But also, uh, the link that is in this PowerPoint, which you can't see now, but I'll post it um, in the announcements, is uh, from an NPR article where they are breeding ligers to combat global warming. So what is a species exactly? Even a four-year-old can pick out an elephant, a dog, and a horse, and a pig, and know these are different entities. Life on Earth can be clustered into distinct types called species. For example, shown here are different species of dogs. Though they are quite similar to one another, they can be easily distinguished in part because there are no intermediate animals that bridge the differences. Species are thus quite real and are not just categories thrust upon the living world by biologists. However, biologists have had a difficult time defining species. Species often do not abide by the rules that we impose on them. For instance, lions and tigers are clearly different species. However, they can produce offspring, which are ligers. Therefore, there are intermediates between lions and tigers, but these do not occur in nature. So a liger is a male lion that mates with a female liger, so that's a little liger. So first we'll talk about the biological species concept, which is the first blank, and um, the other blank is fertile. So the according to the biological species concept, uh, this is where life can be clustered into distinct types where the individuals can produce biological offspring. The biological species concept is a group of organisms that interbreed in nature and are reproductively isolated. As we talked about already a little bit, um, defining a species can be tricky. Researchers have applied two different definitions, the biological species concept and the ecological species concept. So we're starting with the biological species concept. According to the biological species concept, a species is a group of interbreeding organisms that is reproductively isolated from other organisms. The reason the, there are gorillas and chimpanzees is that these two species cannot interbreed with one another. Even if the lion and tiger example raised a moment ago is consistent with the biological species concept, since lions and tigers do not interact with one another in the wild, one of the reasons that members of the same species look and act similarly is that interbreeding organisms share genes with one another, a concept known as gene flow. So gene flow, again, is when members of a species share genes. However, many researchers argue that reproductive isolation alone is not sufficient for defining a species and that the boundaries between species is more strongly maintained by natural selection than by a lack of gene flow. This idea is called the ecological species concept. For example, the grants observed that the medium ground finch can and will interbreed with the large ground finch. According to the biological species concept, this would make these two birds two variants of the same species. However, the grants have observed that the medium and large ground finch have not merged into a single species. They remain recognizable and distinct. Why? What the grants have found is that hybrids of the medium and large ground finch have a low survival rate, as is shown in the graph above. These intermediate bird beaks that result from a mating between a medium and a large ground finch are not optimal for eating either of the seeds on which the medium and large ground finch feed, unless they fall in the valleys between selective peaks. At these selective peaks are the small, medium, and large ground finches, shown from left to right below, which possess bird beaks of optimal size to eat, respectively, um, three different kinds of seeds found in their environment. Intermediate bird beaks, which are the result of hybridizations, have a lower survival rate. 
Therefore, natural selection and not reproductive isolation keeps these populations distinct as different species. So the blanks on this slide um, is uh, natural selection. So support for this comes from the uh, evidence that shows that almost half of all species are not reproductively isolated. Some species have little or no gene flow. So this happens not just in birds, but in many other organisms as well. As you can see in the graph, a survey of almost 300 plant and animal species found that almost half of all species are not reproductively isolated, and thus would not qualify as a different species according to the biological species concept. Furthermore, there are different there are species which have very little or even no genes left to be numbered. The checker spot butterfly shown here lives in isolated pockets throughout California. Researchers have studied their movements and have found that they rarely fly more than 100 yards away from their place of birth. Yet, they live in populations sometimes separated by hundreds of kilometers. Gene flow does not keep them genetically similar. Instead, natural selection is probably serving that role. Nevertheless, researchers agree that both natural selection and reproductive isolation are important in maintaining species boundaries. With a slightly better understanding of what species actually are, we can begin to think about how different species evolve. Darwin called the origin of species the mystery of mysteries, and although researchers are getting a better handle on how speciation occurs, it is difficult to study. Microevolution, evolution within a species, is relatively easy to study in the field or in the laboratory as we've seen, but macroevolution usually takes longer, making it difficult to observe in a lifetime though it often happens too rapidly to be picked up in the fossil record. Nevertheless, the evidence seems to support three different mechanisms for speciation, allopatric, parapatric, and sympatric. We'll start with the allopatric. Allopatric speciation happens when there's a physical barrier between populations. This requires geographic isolation, which is the blank. Selection may favor Different phenotypes in these isolated populations and eventually result in speciation. For example, imagine the following hypothetical scenario. A Galapagos island is quite mountainous and possesses wet environments at high elevation and dry environments at low elevations. There is a finch species on this island that lives in both habitats but possesses a medium-sized beak since there is a gene flow connecting the populations living in the wet and dry regions. A severe storm with strong winds carries a bunch of these birds to a low-flying island with only a dry habitat. Here, large-beaked individuals are selected over time, leading to the evolution of a large-beaked ground finch. Eventually, some of these large-beaked birds are blown back to the original island from where their ancestors came. If these birds can interbreed, then gene flow will cause all of the birds to have medium-sized beaks again. However, if enough time has passed for the genetic changes to accumulate to the point that the birds can no longer interbreed, then the differences will persist and these will be two different species of birds. Courtship behaviors or mating songs may evolve differences, ultimately leading to reproductive isolation. This is known as reinforcement, so your blanks here are reproductive isolation. Though this example was hypothetical, there is evidence that it has actually occurred. The illustration on the right shows how character displacement um, I'm sorry, this uh, the illustration on the right shows how character displacement on the island of Santa Cruz has resulted in morphological differences between two species, the medium and the small ground finch. The beak depth is, on, is most different between these species on Santa Cruz where there is competition for food and resources between these birds. However, let's talk about parapatric speciation. This is based on the concept that some individuals just get up and move. So parapatric speciation is a model of species uh, formation in which selection is combined with partial genetic uh, uh, isolation. I'll repeat that. Parapatric speciation is a model of species formation in which selection is combined with partial genetic isolation. An example of this is shown on this slide. 
Baboons in Africa live in a variety of different habitats from tropical rainforests to grassland environments. In these different habitats and in different regions across Africa, different species of baboons have evolved. The yellow baboon, olive baboon, chocolate baboon, hamadryas baboon, and guinea baboon. However, researchers do not entirely agree on how to classify these baboons, since in regions where their habitats intersect, these baboons interbreed. Those are called hybrid zones, so that's when the habitats intersect and they breed. However, if selection is strong enough in these different habitats, and if the hybrids are less fit than non-hybrids, then eventually, through reinforcement, these different baboons will become reproductively isolated. Parapatric speciation is very difficult to observe in nature. This is due to one primary factor. Patterns of parapatry can easily be explained by an alternate mode of speciation, particularly documenting closely related species sharing common boundaries does not imply that parapatric speciation was the mode that created this geographic distribution pattern. So like I said, it's difficult to observe in nature and it's more common in marine species, which is your blank, because total geographic isolation is not possible. One final mechanism of speciation is called sympatric speciation. Sympatric speciation is the strong version of parapatric speciation, so they're not necessarily mutually exclusive in this case. And this is when um, natural selection and natural selection alone create different phenotypes in different species, even if there is no geographic separation whatsoever. In sympatric speciation, natural selection may favor two different morphs or two equally successful solutions to the same environmental problem. In that case, to avoid direct competition, two types um, or organisms may begin to evolve in the same region, eventually leading to the evolution of different species altogether. It is unclear if this happens very much in nature, though it has been done in the laboratory with bacteria. Shown on this slide are three different mechanisms for speciation we just discussed, allopatric, parapatric, and sympatric is the one below. So a rare example of sympatric speciation in animals is the divergence of resident and transient orca forms in the Northeast Pacific. Resident and transient orcas inhabit the same waters but avoid each other and do not interbreed. The two forms hunt different prey species and have different diets, vocal behavior, and social structures. Some divergences between species could also result from contrasts in microhabitats. A population bottleneck around 200,000 years ago greatly reduced the population size at that time, as well as the genes which allowed several ecotypes to emerge afterwards. So that's an example of sympatric speciation. Here's another example. So imagine you have two, um, you have fruit flies living in the same orchard. Over time, some of them begin eating from apple trees and then the others start to eat um, from cherry trees. What happens is that as they spend all this time on the separate types of trees, they start mating there. And over time, this leads to reproductive isolation. So they're in the same habitat, yet they evolve into separate species.